I asked for a dominant performance from Carolina basketball over the weekend, and we finally got it. Plus, it's always a great day to celebrate a national championship. What up, women's field hockey? You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Monday, November 20th, 2023. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you everydayers for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listener watch to get your Tar Heels content every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. It's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOnCollege to get started. Look, come join our Discord, man. You need to get in on this thing. We're having great conversation all the time. Uh, Even this weekend, while things were not great at Clemson, but while things were good in just about every other arena of Carolina athletics, we're just having great conversation all the time. So much fun. Come join us. The link is in the show notes. Coming up on the show today, speaking of which, we're going to talk about uh, the game at Clemson. Kind of a bummer, but uh, we got to unpack it. Our weekend whip around, which, as I said, includes a national championship victory, but a couple other teams advancing in postseason as well. But of course, we're going to have our basketball recap uh, from the men's victory over UC Riverside on Friday night, including the four corners recap and the shady stat of the game. So let's get into it with this part of the conversation first. On Friday's show, I asked, nay, I begged North Carolina to have a dominant performance on Friday night. Um, I felt like we had had good and solid performances out of the team the first two games, but a lot of it was, you know, just kind of figuring each other out. You're bringing in all these transfers. You got four returners and the two uh, freshmen coming in and Zayden High and Elliott Cadeau. And so, yeah, it takes time to bring that all together. But still, it's a tune-up game. I wanted to see dominance, and they did for the first time this season and did so without even shooting magnificently well, either from three or the field. They were under 50% from the game, which you're going to have that, but still to do that and have a dominant performance says something to me about what this team can do. Uh, I mean, part, part of the dominance that I had asked for was Carolina hadn't done a great job with their starts and they did in this one. They had a double digit lead fewer than 10 minutes into the game They had built a 20-point lead with 8.39 left on the clock in the first half. And aside from that stretch at the end of the first half where Carolina missed, I was like eight in a row, um, I saw exactly what I wanted to see from the Tar Heels in terms of turning in a great performance. Yes, the margin was down to 11 at halftime, but Carolina went on a 19-0 run to start the second half. They grew the lead to 30, and it never dropped back below 24. That's great. That's exactly what I needed to see heading into the battle for Atlantis. Another thing I had asked for is for a non-Armando, non-RJ player to step up. Not that I didn't want Armando and RJ to perform well, which they did, but that I needed more from some of the other guys. Who was going to put their foot down along with Harrison Ingram to say, look, I'm that other dude and I'm going to show up in a big way. So Harrison, let's start with him because he had done that and did it Again, he didn't have an efficient shooting night, but he had 10 points, nine rebounds. I mean, he needs to continue helping out Armando on the glass because Carolina got out rebounded in this game. It was only by one, but they did. Uh, Ingram had an assist, a steal, and importantly, didn't turn the ball over at all. Beyond that, I love seeing all the little things he's doing, like diving on the floor to get an offensive rebound in a blowout. Jalen Washington. Uh, was one of the ones that I thought can really start stepping up in major ways. The more he steps up, the less Armando has to play. And not that you don't want Armando to, you know, you want Armando in like that 25 to 29 range, probably minutes per game. But even just that 25 side of it allows Mondo to be more efficient, which means that Jay Wash is doing his job. And he did on Friday night, um, hit his first two career three pointers. I was one game earlier. Remember, I had predicted ahead of the Lehigh game that Jay Wash would hit his first career three, but 
we were rewarded by waiting with getting two in one game from Jay Wash. He was four of five from the field, two of two hit both, only took two three point attempts, made them both. Um, 11 points, one of two from the free throw line, had five rebounds, two blocks. Love what he's adding. And the more he gets comfortable um, and the more he's doing those things, it's going to put Carolina in a great place. What about his sophomore classmate, Seth Trimble? Perhaps his best game as a Tar Heel, five of seven from the floor, one of one from three, scored 11 points himself, two rebounds, an assist, and also zero turnovers. That's back-to-back games. Remember the game before, he had three assists and no turnovers. You'll love it. And with Seth, holy cow, that dunk, man, that's something. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But perhaps what impressed me more was that one-man fast break that he had, um, which he finished very nicely at the rim through traffic. Uh, just seeing more confidence out of Seth this year. He and Jalen Washington combined, the two sophomores, were 9 of 12 from the floor. Whew. You don't expect that every game, but you'll take it when you can get it. What about Jalen Withers? He didn't score a ton, um, just two free throws for two points, and he missed his only field goal attempt, but he did other things to help out the team. Had three rebounds, had three blocks, and my dude's blocks are <laughs> vicious. I love watching Jalen Withers block the basketball. It was great stuff. Zayden High had his first career field goal, and very appropriately, it was like a rebound putback dunk, a little tip dunk. Love to see that. Had two steals. He himself diving off the floor uh, after a loose ball, in a, again, in a blowout. So Zayden, not his most productive game of his first three of his career, but did things that helped the team win. That's what you're looking for. And perhaps most importantly, with what I needed to see, I think you probably saw this too, and you felt it as much as I did. This looked like Carolina basketball, perhaps more than at any point I've seen in the previous two seasons. And yes, that includes the run to the national championship game. I mean, th- think about that play with the that ended with the Seth block or with the Seth dunk. You had. Jalen Withers block, which was almost, it was like a three quarter. It wasn't like a sidearm pitch, but he almost blocked it like that. It looked like that went to RJ Davis. RJ took like a dribble and threw a left-handed notice. Was it? Ah, man, I'm second guessing myself. I feel like it was a left-handed, like three quarter court, one hand bounce pass ahead to Seth who skied for a two handed dunk where he basically flexed back behind himself looked so much like his brother, JP Tokito. And so like, if you didn't see this comparison, go look at my Twitter there. Uh, there's a video of it in my word or talking about it, looking like Carolina basketball, seeing some secondary break going, man, you just love these things. The, the team did what I wanted to see them do ahead of Atlantis. Was everything perfect? By no means. Is it moving in the direction you want to see? Absolutely it is. And that's what we'll watch to see Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday down in the Bahamas. One extra little nugget about the team and and performance. Got to hone in on Mondo. How about this dude moving into the top 10 in all-time scoring in the Carolina record books? And how appropriate and poignantly timed that it was Walter Davis that he passed. Well, I mean, just a very meaningful moment. So Mondo's up to 1877 right now. Next up is Brad Darty's 44 points ahead. So I would imagine Armando should pass him this week, given what he's averaging. I mean, shoot, maybe even in the second of the three games at Battle for Atlantis. And by the way, since he's sitting at 1877, needs just 123 more points to get to 2000 for his career. Only six Tar Heels previous have ever done that. And by the way, he'll pass Anton Jameson and Larry Miller in the process. And forecasting even further ahead, it's more likely than not that Armando is going to finish second all time in scoring only behind Tyler Hansborough, who's so far out ahead of everybody. No one should or will catch him. So, man, great stuff. Just that is the big takeaway from Friday night's game over UC Riverside. Carolina had a dominant performance that showed the vast majority of the things that you want to see from this team, this team that is coming together. I mean, it's going to take some time. Just keep reminding yourself of that. And so uh, great stuff all around. Now, 
Next, we need to get to the four corners recap where we look at four specific things that I thought were important takeaways from this game, along with the shady stat of the game. Yes, that is a play on words on my own last name. Absolutely, it is. We're going to do all that in just a second. But first, I need to tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by Listening.com, our brand new sponsor. Now, you might be aware, maybe not, that in addition to what I do for Locked On and sports media stuff, I'm also a full-time professor. Yes, I don't know how, but it all happens. And I got to tell you, when I read about our brand new partner, Listening.com, I was stoked for my students to try it out. I'm going to tell all my classes about it when we get back from Thanksgiving break. Because yeah, I get the entire week off at my college. I love it. So college students, listen up. There's this incredible app called listening.com. It can take any academic paper, PDF, class material, whatever, and turn it into an audio book. I love that because you could be doing dishes or chores, driving in your car, whatever, and studying and learning on the fly. It's awesome. It can read math equations, technical words, complicated documents. It knows to skip citations, footnotes, stuff like that, and lets you jump straight to the point in the reading where you want to go. It even has one-click note-taking button where it automatically puts the last 10 seconds into a notepad so you don't have to try to type notes while you're listening. It can just do it for you. Best of all, usually when you start checking out listening.com, you get two weeks free, but if you use the link listening.com slash locked on, you'll be able to get your first three weeks free. So go ahead, give it a try and get an extra free week when you go to listening.com slash locked on listening.com help make your learning more efficient. By the way, locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24 seven streaming channel on YouTube. That's right. We are the first to ever launch a 24 seven all day long streaming sports channel on YouTube. Make sure to go check it out. Um, the great stuff coming all day. You might know I've talked about I'm the co-host of Locked On College Basketball. It airs every day at 2 p.m. Eastern. Go check it out. Would love to see you there. All right. It's time for the Four Corners recap and our shady stat of the game. Number one, Carolina's depth seems legit and that Coach Davis, for the first time in his you know two-plus season tenure is going to be able to use that depth. You know, whether or not you you agree that Carolina had the depth the past two years, this is the first year that it seems like he's legitimately comfortable playing that depth. Does that difference make sense? I, I hope so. Here, let me give you some statistical data to back that up. Through three games, only once has a player played 30 or more minutes. That was Cormac Ryan in the first game, and I think it was like 30 minutes and 37 seconds. So even that was short. By comparison, so once it's happened in three games, by comparison, last year through three games, six different times a player played 30 or more minutes. Two, Coach Davis's first year through three games, 10 instances of a player playing 30 or more minutes in the first three games. Let's use some Ken Palm numbers to help tell the story. In Coach Davis's first year, Carolina's bench was used 20 for 20% 20 of the Tar Heels minutes. They were 348th in the nation in bench usage. There's that year there were 363 teams. Uh last year, Carolina used their bench even less, 18% of the time, good for 360th in the nation. This year, so far, right? I know it's early. So far, they are using their bench 34% of the time. That's 114th in the country. Well down from 348th or 360th in the country. So that just serves to back up what I'm telling you. Let's look at it even more specifically from Friday night's game. Carolina's first six baskets, first six field goals, came from six different players. That's awesome. All 10 players that played legitimate minutes, which is all the scholarship players other than James Aconquo, all of whom played 10 or more minutes, every one of them scored some points. All 10 of them. You love that. And I love that also because it's not just about playing the depth. It's about role definition for the players so that they can know when they're coming in, what they're doing, all that. We've seen a pretty consistent rhythm developing with this, specifically with the first half substitution patterns. There's subs coming in right around the media timeouts. Here's what happened Friday. With just over 16 minutes left, under 16 is that first media timeout. 
Jalen Washington and Elliot Cadeau checked in. Just right around the 12 minute mark, under 12 is the second media timeout. Jalen Withers and Seth Trimble checked in. And then at the eight minute, uh, Zayden High checked in, meaning at that point, 12 minutes into the game, you've now gone 10 deep. And that's the 10 we expect to play significant minutes. Um, all the scholarship guys other than James Aconquo. That's awesome. That's exactly what you're looking for. But the bottom line is this. While it's been used well so far, we're going to really understand what coach is going to do with his depth this week in Atlantis. Now, you expect him to use it more because it's three games in three days. But still, you'll get a good idea of it in terms of who's playing specifically in the second and third games of the week. And then an even better idea, the Wednesday after Thanksgiving when Carolina hosts Tennessee. So we'll watch for that. Number two in our Four Corners recap. Love to see the defense contributing in a major way. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, I said it was a, a strongly dominant performance from Carolina, but in a game where they didn't shoot well. So how were they able to be dominant in a game where they didn't shoot all that terribly well? It's the defense. UC Riverside didn't score a single point in the second half for the first nine minutes and 27 seconds. These games are only 40 minutes long, folks. Each half is 20 minutes. That means Carolina held UC Riverside scoreless for a quarter, approximately one quarter of the game at a single stretch of time. You ain't going to lose many games when you're doing that. Now, some of that is UC Riverside just not making shots, but it, it you got to contribute or attribute, excuse me, some of that to the defense. Very well done by Carolina. Now, Carolina hasn't been a team in, in the last couple of years that has defended the rim very well. Eight blocks in this game. Jalen Withers, we already talked about his blocks. Ferocious. You love to see it. And, and there's other guys contributing to that too. We talked about Jalen Washington having two. I think Armando had one. Like, just great stuff. And most importantly, here's the thing. It's not just about blocking shots. The, the best shot blockers are guys who can not only block it, but either deflect it to their team or keep it in bounds somehow. In fact, that data is not in box scores, but I always go and fetch it after every game. Of Carolina's eight blocks, they retained possession on four of them. That's great. That's well above what usually happens. Just trust me on that. So for the game, UC Riverside, Riverside shot. 30.6%. You'll take that every day of the week. Number three in our four corners recap, Carolina's turnovers. Been in the double digits so far. That's You'll take that in the low double digits because Carolina's been playing faster, but you'd love to see it get down into the single digits. And obviously it's all about percentage of turnovers, how many possessions and at what, because it's all based on how fast you're playing. You know, the more possessions, the more, it makes sense, right? In this game, Carolina just had nine turnovers. Most importantly, only one in the first half, and that came in the final four minutes of the first half. Elliot Cadeau had a turnover. Now, the Tar Heels did have eight in the second half. You don't love that, but you can excuse it in a game where Carolina is just running away with things. Now, also to mention, five of those eight second half turnovers and six of the nine for the game were attributed to the two freshmen. In the second half, Elliot had three and Zayden High had two. So you look at that and you can understand it because you don't you expect the freshman to just be a little more careless with the ball at this stage. But <clears throat> all in all, turnovers were down and you love to see that. Number four on the four corners recap. My biggest concern currently is Carolina's three-point shooting. In this game, they were only six of 21. That is 28.6% from three. Clearly less than ideal. And for the season, the Tar Heels are shooting 31%. I firmly believe that number's coming up. We got to see it happen, but no reason to think it won't, just based on the history of what these players have done from beyond the arc and based on the fact of how much of a black hole Armando Baycott will be at pulling defenses to him. Of the six in this game, though, of the six three-pointers that Carolina made, one of them was Armando. One was Seth Trimble and two were Jalen Washington. So four of the six were attributed to guys that you don't expect to get threes. Of the other two, one for RJ, one for Harrison Ingram. That's what you're expecting. Now, of those four that came from Armando, Seth, and Jay Wash, it's nice for those guys to hit. But I want that to be the icing on the cake, not the foundation of the cake. The foundation needs to be 
RJ and Cormac Ryan and Harrison Ingram, right? Like that's who you're looking for to make them consistently. But at the same time, hear me say this. Six of 21 and 28.6% seems bad. But had Carolina just made three more threes on Friday night, meaning nine of 21 instead of six of 21, that's 42.9%. So it doesn't take much to get back to where you need to be. So you put three more of those threes in the basket and you're feeling really different about that. Again, I think that's going to go away. I think Carolina will get there. Um, and, and we just got to wait for it to happen. All right. Shady stat of the game. Let's go back to our Mondo Baycott. I forgot my sunglasses. I got to pretend goggles. Here we go. These are my sunglasses today. <laughs> Shady stat of the game. Armando Baycott drew seven fouls in this game, meaning he of the opponent's fouls, he drew seven of them. And for the season is now averaging six fouls drawn per game. He had seven uh, against Lehigh and four drawn against Radford, averaging out to six per game so far. Best of all. He's getting to the free throw line, obviously, off of some of those fouls and converting them at an 85% clip. He's taking, while he's drawn six fouls, he's taking 6.7 free throws a game and he's making 85% of them. This is a dude that has never shot 70% from the free throw line in a season. He's 17 of 20 right now. Do I expect that number to go down? Yes, 100% I do. The way the shot looks, the consistency of it, I mean, it, it's not been fluky looking shots. It's looked good and gone in cleanly. So I legitimately feel like Armando can stay above 70% this year. That alone could be the difference for this team. And I know that might sound too much of a, of a thing, but think about how much Armando will live at the free throw line. If he can jump into the 70s or maybe <laughs> like, in a crazy world, stay in the low 80s. I don't, I don't see that. I see mid 70s. That feels maybe realistic. That could win some games that Carolina didn't win last year, and that completely changes everything. So, shady stat of the game: Armando drawing six fouls a game so far this year. You'd love to see him keep that up. Well, we got to turn the leaf from happy times with the basketball team to sad times with the football team. But never fear, I'm going to follow it up with some happy national championship vibes. So we'll get to all of those things in just a second, right after I tell you that today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by our good friends at FanDuel. Hey, look, you can score this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks if your team wins. Maybe you've been thinking about joining FanDuel. Now's the time. There's no better to get in on the action. Their app is super easy to use. They've got a wide range of betting options for you, spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. For example, here are the odds for Battle for Atlantis. Carolina has the best odds at plus 330. Arkansas is next at plus 350, followed by Villanova at plus 500, Memphis at plus 550, and it goes on down from there. So friends, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get in on the action this NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Okay, let's get into talking about Carolina's loss to Clemson on Saturday night in Death Valley. Here's the, here's the thing for me. I tweeted this out. I want to say it here too. Yeah, hate to keep harping on. You really do. But if Carolina had taken advantage of winning the games they needed to win, if they had taken care of business against Virginia and against Georgia Tech, you wouldn't be in this position right now. You would be in the driver's seat for the ACC championship game. And so in this one, with the Clemson team that frankly has gotten infinitely better the last several weeks, at that point, you just tip your hat to what happened on Saturday night and you say, hey, tough one. That's Death Valley a near impossible place to go in and win. We move on. Let's let's refocus. Go get NC State, and we end the regular season with one loss. I will take that all day long. But that, unfortunately, is not where we're at. Carolina did lose both of those games, and that made this feel like a much more necessary game to win. Now, Carolina, could, like even before they kicked off, could not have won that, or not won, but made the ACC championship game because Miami couldn't beat 
Louisville just in in the slot right beforehand. But still, you, you just hate that you were in that position because you didn't take care of business in winnable games a couple weeks ago. That's frustrating. All that said, there's still a lot to play for. You, The respect of winning at Clemson for the first time in a long, 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 long time. The respect of finishing off these three games in a row, winning a home against Duke at Clemson at NC State. You'd love to have done that. All right, let's get into a few things with this football game. Uh, on, on Friday's show where we previewed the football game, Brian Chagos talked about surviving the Death Valley environment. Carolina, the, the question was, can they survive this crazy raucous environment for the first seven or eight minutes? Yeah, they absolutely, not only were they able to survive it, they came out of it with the lead. But the problem was that lead was only seven to nothing instead of 17 to nothing or 21 to nothing. Because Carolina was able to stop Clemson multiple times, two three and outs, in fact, on Clemson's first three possessions. And Carolina was poised for other touchdowns or another touchdown and a field goal at the least. But unfortunately, Omarion Hampton had his first two fumbles of the season. And I mean, it's just, it's going to happen sometime to a running back. You can't look at that and say, oh, Marion Hampton, you scoundrel, shouldn't have trusted you. No. Not at all. In fact, we'll talk about in a second. He was probably the biggest bright spot for Carolina in this game. But you, you still can't help but feel like you should have exited the first quarter up 17 or 21 to nothing. And come on, man. The the fumble out of the end zone being a turnover and your opponent getting the ball on the, on the 20 as a touchback is maybe the least logical football rule there is. Like. Go with me. Oh, I'm. you know, if I had fumbled the ball two yards earlier and it went out of bounds at the one, I get the ball there. So because it goes out of bounds on the backside of the pylon, suddenly it's a turnover? No, that is so illogical. Much more logical. Hey, give the team the ball where they fumbled it, just like you would if it where it had been out of bounds. Or maybe if you want to punish them for fumbling out, like you could back it up a little bit, but even that feels illogical to me. I just, this rule is so asinine. It's got to be done away with, but it is what it is. You, you got to hold on to the ball. And I mean, I get that great play by the Clemson defender. Um, a couple other things on the football game. My key matchup for this game was Carolina's offense coming in third in the nation in total offense against Clemson's defense coming in fifth in the nation in total defensive yards allowed. And Again, through the first quarter, things were looking good. Carolina won that first quarter in this battle. Problem is, Clemson won the final three quarters. They figured it out and had things going. After the first quarter, Drake only completed 11 passes the rest of the game. I mean, it's just, even in a game where Omarion's running wild, like it's the inverse. I would have figured, uh, you know, if you had asked me to make a wager on whether Carolina's run or pass had more success, I would have said pass, but it was not the case. And let's move there, because that's the next thing I want to look at. Despite those two fumbles from Amarion Hampton, he was the bright spot for Carolina. In fact, I believe, if I remember correctly, the way Coach Brown put it in his postgame presser was, listen, I say what you want about Omarion. We don't have the level of success we did in this game without him, despite those two fumbles. Now, again, you, you hate it, because game, this game is completely different if he's able to hold on to those. But. 19 rushes for 178 yards on the ground. For reference, Clemson gives up 109 rushing yards to the entire team per game. My man's got 178. Six straight games now with over 100 rushing yards for Marion Hampton. I mean, this, this season, folks, for him individually, don't miss it. It is special and it is unique. Two other things from the football game, quickly. Um, I thought, you know, you, you never want to blame the refs for a loss because you got to go make plays despite it. That said, there were some critical penalties uh, that were either called or not called in this game that hurt the Tar Heels. Let me just point out three. I'm sure we could find more. Uh, the roughing the passer <clears throat> call on Cedric Gray as Carolina got that interception in the end zone on Clemson's last possession of the first half. 
I mean, I get the letter of the law with that rule, but come on. That's brutal. The play where Tez Walker is running into the end zone and the D-back from Clemson is just tugging on his arm, disallowing him from being able to get the ball, not to mention not even looking back at like, to me, to my vantage point, I'd love to know your thoughts on this. I thought he was trying to get a DPI because he knew he was burned and Tez is going to score there. Did it seem that way to you? Like It was like he was begging to get a DPI to save himself from giving up six. No flag. Come on. And the TD going into halftime, wh- whatever, man. Like the, the problem there to me is that you don't have the right video angles. And it's funny, and kind of, actually I say funny, it's sad because I was doing show prep for this episode as I was watching Sunday Night Football between the Vikings and the Broncos. There was a play where Josh Dobbs is scrambling for a first down right at the end of the game. And you get this perfect look from the first down marker straight across the field. Why? Because the NFL pylons at the goal line, the first down marker, the line of scrimmage, whatever, all have cameras in them pointing straight across. Why on earth do we not have that angle of that play with Cade Klubnik um, scoring right at halftime? Not to mention, what a dumb move. Like, that is not a good football play. Like, that is bad football um, logic. If he, if Carolina had stopped him short, if Carolina had been refer, or if that play had been called as Carolina stopped him short, they don't get any points there. Bad, bad football IQ from Cade Clubney. Anyway. We've got the technology. Why aren't we using it? You should be able to have a clear line of if that ball crossed the plane before his knee was down. We didn't get it. Uh, The other thing I want to talk about with the football game is Carolina just did. There was a, a timeout utilized in each half that I thought was poor timeout utilization in the first half. It was just before Clemson's final drive. Carolina um, starts this drive with minute 55 on the clock. Nice run from Drake May on first down, but unfortunately he's sacked for an eight yard loss uh, on the very next play. Carolina has second and 18 from the 15 yard line. Now at this point, Clemson has two timeouts left. There is 129 left on the clock. So if you're Carolina, you know, you just say, hey, the game's tied at seven. We're in Death Valley. We should have more points. We don't. But let's go to the locker room tied at that. You can't run out the clock, but we'll take seven to seven and we can limit how much time Clemson has on the clock. So if Carolina doesn't call a timeout there, here's what happens. Clemson calls one to stop the clock at 129. Carolina runs their second and 18 play. Yeah, let's take four seconds off for that. Call it 125. Clemson used their final timeout. So now it's third and 15. You run again. That play would end at about 120. You run the play clock down all 40 seconds, call a timeout at about 40 seconds left on the clock, and then you punt. Instead, because Carolina took the timeout, then Clemson is able to still stop the clock twice more, meaning that they got the ball back at 114 instead of 40. That's a huge difference. We don't even have to be worrying about that uh, that roughing the passer call on said great. We don't even have to be worrying about whether or not Cade Klubnik made it into the end zone at that point because Clemson doesn't have enough time to play with. That was that was bad, poor usage of timeouts to me. The other one in the second half, Carolina scores to make it 31-20 Clemson with 7.03 to go in the game. Coach Brown decides to go for two there because analytics, whatever. I wouldn't have, but I, I, whatever. We'll not get into that right now. But unfortunately, Carolina wasn't going to get the playoff on the two-point conversion. So they call a timeout so that they can still go for two. Now, I get that you're going to go for two there. Again, I disagree with it, but understand it, whatever. Cool. But you're going to burn a timeout so that you can still go for two instead of just taking the delay of game, going back five, and letting Noah Burnett kick to get within 10. At that point in the game, where you still need to score twice, saving and preserving that timeout is infinitely more important than trying to go for two. That's just the logical thing there. All right. Oh, still, though, here we go. 
Carolina has a shot at double digit wins. If they can win at state next Saturday, and if they can win whatever bowl game they're playing in, right? Like at this point, that is your target. Hey, let's go win. We will have won against Duke and NC state this year. Love that. We will have nine wins in the regular season. And if you can get to your bowl game and win, you got 10 wins overall. That's what Carolina needs to do. Okay, quick. Let's get off the, the sad times of the football and get the happy times. Field hockey, national champions for the 11th time and the fifth time in the last six years. If you didn't watch this, Matt, you need to go back and watch it. The Each team scored once, Carolina and Northwestern, in the third quarter. Nobody else scored again. We go to an overtime. There's some close calls there, but nobody scores. Carolina just misses a penalty shot. Second overtime, get a massive save from Matty Kahn. Uh, another good stop a couple minutes later. Nobody scores. So now we're going to shootouts. It's just like soccer, five ladies for each team. If you're tied after that, it's just sudden victory is how they call it now instead of sudden death. Um, so both teams are tied at two after those initial five shooters. And then so Matty Kahn gets a save on the first um, sudden sudden victory play. And then Riley Heck goes and gets it. Boom. Game over. Carolina wins. And so, I mean, un unreal stuff to go from Aaron Matson winning last year as a player to Bubba Cunningham picking her as the head coach and her winning again as a 23 year old head coach at the dominant field hockey program in the country. It's unreal. Unreal. First to ever do it to win back to back as a player and coach. Great stuff. Keep it rolling. Speaking of postseason play, soccer, both soccer teams are still alive. The women advanced to the Elite Eight on Sunday. They beat six-seeded uh, Alabama on Friday 1-0 and then beat second-seeded Texas Tech actually in Lubbock for that one 1-0 on Sunday. So next up, the ladies will face in the Elite Eight BYU, the one seed in their region. They got to go to Provo for this. It's next Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern on ESPN+. Plus. So make sure to check that out. Men's soccer. Advanced to the Sweet 16 on Sunday by beating Memphis 2 to nothing. Next, they will host Hofstra at Dorrance Field next Sunday, 5 Eastern, also on ESPN+. Plus. So, great postseason things happening for Carolina. Women's basketball got a victory over Elon on Saturday. Um, volleyball lost, unfortunately, to Florida State. Cross country, men finished 6th in the nation. Love that. And wrestling split on Sunday, beat Central Michigan, and then lost to Illinois. So uh, for the most part, great stuff all over Tar Heel Athletics this weekend. Man, it's so good. All right, folks, that's it for the Monday show. Going to be with you all week long, even though it's Thanksgiving week. That's right. Five shows as always, because I want to be there for you all the time. we got a lot of great basketball action this week, so we got to make sure to stay on top of it. All right, good. Thanks for staying with me with it all. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Let me remind you to come join our Discord channel where you can chat with us all the time on Tar Heel stuff. You can email the show Locked on Tar Heels. Give us a follow on Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe, smash the like button, and leave your comments on the show. Y'all, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel, especially on a national championship Monday. <laughs> you love it. We'll talk again tomorrow, but until then, peace.